motion is made by nine residents of the city of Troy who are nominated by the mayor and approved by the majority of city council for terms usually lasting for three years. Uh, tonight is a study meeting on tonight's agenda. We have a, a look at uh, revisions to uh, chapter 85, the signed ordinance, a potential conditional rezoning application, and we're going to continue with uh, our discussion on planning commission goals. So with that, please call the roll. Mr. Edmonds. Here. Mr. Hudson. Here. Mr. Krent. Here. Mr. Maxwell. Here. Mr. Sanzika. Here. Mr. Shepke. Mr. Schultz. Here. Mr. Stratt. Here. Mr. Tagle. Here. Now we have a quorum. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of tonight's agenda. I'll move the approval. Moved by Mr. Hudson, second by Mr. Edmonds. Vote in motion, please. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Maxwell. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Here. Mr. Schultz. Yes, yes, sir. Mr. Stratt. Yes. Mr. Tegel. Yes. Mr. Evans. Yes. All right, motion passes. Next is uh, item number three, approval of the minutes of the May 8th, 2012 regular meeting. Moved by Mr. Evans. Support Mr. Tegel. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Mr. Stratt. May I add an agenda item on here? Well, let's, uh, I'll tell you what. I want to, let's jump back to, we'll finish uh, the vote on the agenda. The agenda, then we'll jump back to that. Okay. Vote please on the... Well, this is on the minutes. minutes. Right. 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 On the minutes. Mr. Crank. Yes. yes. Mr. Maxwell. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mr. Stratt. Yes. Mr. Tagle. Yes. Mr. Evans. Yes. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Mr. Stratt, would you like, what would you like to add to tonight's agenda? On the Board of Appeals meeting agenda. Oh, we got there. That's your number, number five. We do that? <laughs> oh, we got the wrong agenda. Sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry. Let's go to number four. Which is public comment for items oh. not on tonight's agenda. So okay. you're wishing to comment on any okay. item that's not on tonight's agenda. Yeah, I know. All right, so no one will close that item. You ready, Mr. Strad? We're coming back to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, I felt neglected. neglected. That's all. <laughs> Mr. Strad, I promised I wasn't going to neglect you. All right. You know, okay. I'm trying to give you a better seat. I'm trying to, you know. Thank you very much. Zoning Mr. Board Chairman. of Appeals, ZBA report. Mr. Strad. Okay. I, we had one item on the agenda, and it was a variance that was granted. And uh, it was actually a, uh, a screw up on the building department's. Part. The uh, building department approved the construction documents and all the locations, and the builder and contractor actually uh, put in the foundation, basement walls, and everything. And then all of a sudden, they got a stop order that they were in violation in terms of setback. But it did not, uh, it was in the lower area, and uh, we looked at all the conditions, and we felt that certainly this was going to be a vast improvement. The variance that they were asking for was not that great, and it was going to be a considerable improvement. And there were a lot of homes that were also already within the, they were non-conforming in that area. So, give you an update on that. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Strand. Appreciate it. Uh, next is item number six, Downtown Development Authority DDA report. Mr. Yeah, the DDA actually had a meeting last week. They approved the budget for fiscal year 2012-2013. And they appointed Mark Miller as executive director, replacing the departed John Zerlein. Any further? That's it. Okay, any questions? All right. Now to planning and zoning report. I assume that's you again. That's me again. We've got a uh, pretty pretty uh, busy meeting coming up <coughs> in June, the regular meeting, second Tuesday. We've got a proposed uh, another Kroger gas station. This one is... Uh, it's not contiguous with the Kroger. It'll be on Rochester Road, uh, south of Long Lake, on the west side of the road. There's a vague, there's an empty Burger King building there now. Also, a uh, two site condominium developments. Both have been approved in the past. Both have expired. One is uh, Beachview Beachview Estates. It's an eight-unit site condo uh, south of Long Lake Road, on the um, west side of the road. And the other is Adams Road, Saikano, it's five units. It's a, a cluster development. So we've got, I don't remember the last time we had two residential developments on the same agenda. So that's, uh, I think, a good sign moving forward that things are starting to turn around a little bit. But uh, and I'd like to talk, spend a couple minutes talking about PUD4. Um, it's known now as the Monarch site. Uh, some of us were, were uh, on the Planning Commission when we, when we uh, last reviewed it. One of us 
lives down the street from, uh, <laughs> from it. Um, at the, when it was approved, it was a mixed-use development. It was very, very intense. Uh, I, I want to say a uh, 20-some story tower plus a 19-story tower, I believe. Uh, residential with, uh, with uh, retail on, on the main floor plus some attached condominiums to the north. That property went into foreclosure. It was purchased by, uh, by a, a, a Ark and Jonah. And he's proposing a PUD there that's significantly less intense than what was approved. He's proposing retail along the front, obviously close to Big Beaver, consistent with the Big Beaver corridor study, and with, with 16 residential units to the north, detached, detached single-family homes. He's going to run a street parallel with Big Beaver with eight units on both sides. So it's going to serve as a transition between the retail and the, and the single-family residential. It, but it obviously is dramatically less less intense than what was approved there. Um, I think what was approved there probably the economy isn't going to support that for some time, you know, probably a long time. But um, okay. sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Tango, do you have something on this, uh, or do you want to wait till? Well, I just wanted to ask if as long as we're talking about upcoming projects, have you heard of anything? Uh, the northwest corner of Corporate Crooks, that single-story building, is coming down right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually met with an, with an applicant who wants to come in and resubmit a planning and development. We reviewed their preliminary plans, sent the initial comments back to them, and we're waiting to hear back. Do you, do you know if it was a different developer than we saw before? Same developer. Same, same, basically same project? Yes, yes, but no, no, they're going to revise it. They have been, before they can move on any development there, they can take it down. The building's been vacant for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to come back with a revised PD application. But can I, I want to go back to PUD number four because sure. did you have a question on that, Mr. Schultz? I just the the comment was made and I it was proper, but it was proposed at 20 and 19, but because of the airport, the actual approved PUD was 13 and 11 stories. Okay, I, I, I can I can confirm that. I'm 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 not. But I can, I, if, just, if anyone's curious, I can have we, that information. No, I, I'm just yeah. saying it wasn't approved. It, it, did, it, it was stepped it down. You're right. for the height that it was originally proposed. Yeah. You're right. The, the, the airport approved. You're exactly correct. The FAA made them lower both towers. You're correct. Um, so they, they want to amend. Um, they're they're going to have to amend the PUD. And um, they, the residential the residential guy, it's, it's going to be integrated, but there's a residential component and a, and a retail component. The, the retail person, has got everything leased. I mean, he, he's, re he, he, he can, he, he's ready to put a shovel in the ground tomorrow. Obviously, this process. The residential person says he can, he can sell these 16 units, no problem. So I think this thing's going get, to get done, and it's going to get done fairly quickly. So he's, he's proposing a, a, a relatively aggressive schedule. Um, as a matter of fact, he wants to go with a, with a public hearing in the second, two, the second meeting in June. Now, what I, I've talked to the chairman about this, and I think the reason I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with, a, with an aggressive schedule is if we go with a meeting, if we go to a public hearing in June, we can still have a study item the two weeks before that at the, at the June 12th meeting. And it's not, it's not the scale and the scope and the intensity of the monarch. It's significantly less. In fact, if you remember when we did the zoning ordinance, we talked about what to do with, this, with some of the PUD classifications, whether to keep them PUD or to come up with a different underlying zoning. In this instance, had we eliminated the PUD and gone with, 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 re, with Big Beaver on the front and residential behind, this would almost be a, be a kind of a slam dunk, one, one planning commission meeting. Um, they, are, they do propose a drive through component um, for, a, for a bank, but we we're talking about amending the drive through provisions now anyway. So, they're, they're, so I don't have a lot of heartburn about, about being a little bit aggressive with the scheduling. So what, I want, what I'll do is, is they proposed, they, they talked about uh, dropping off plans this week. I want to, when I get the plans, I'll make them available to, for, for all of you to come in and look at them. I'll also email them to you so you get them ahead of time. So if you have any questions, concerns, you can email me. You can come in and look, we can discuss. I want to be, and as well as for the neighbors, anyone watching at home who wants to, who wants to have the same, the same um, you know, our information, just public information, we're, we're happy to share all our information with you. And um, just give everyone kind of a head start on, on reviewing and getting comments in. Because uh, I want to have, I, th I think it's doable. They, um, you know, they're ready to go. But at the, so I want to be aggressive. At the same time, I want, it's important to get input from the Planning Commission, input from the public, and, do the, and make sure we get a good project. So I think we can, there's a way to strike a balance here. And I want to, yeah, yeah we need your due diligence on it for sure. Uh, Mr. Brent, could, could you give us a list? of those uh, proposed retail um, businesses that are going to go in there? 
If they're already leased, uh, I will I'm ask, curious as to who yeah, they are. I will ask, I will ask <clears> the, um, the developer to bring a list to the, to the first meeting. Okay. okay. Mr. Schultz? What kind of hide are we looking at on Big Beaver? I hope it's not going to be a one-story strip mall on Big Beaver. It's going it, to, at this point, it's one story. That kind of, I, I thought the Big Beaver corridor didn't support one-story structures on Big Beaver. Well, be, be, before I give, before, you know, I want to make sure that everyone's got, you know, get it in front of you before we start really delving into it. Well, I'll get that to you as soon as we get it, and then we can start having some dialogue about that. Mr. Strand? Yeah, uh, why, uh, I thought the whole idea with the uh, PUD was that we can have mixed occupancy within the same structure. And here you're saying that we could have really just split and go with retail and uh, residential in the back. Is that correct? We, we could have eliminated the PUD and, and gone with a different underlying zone. And why we didn't do that was? Just all the work. At the time, at the time we, we recognized all the work that went into that, in that design and we were hopeful that Although a PUD is a lot of work, it's still a negotiated <coughs> process, and you can negotiate things that, that for the betterment of both the applicant and the and the um, and the city. So we, I guess, we just didn't want to eliminate the PUD altogether. We wanted to give the give some applicant a chance to renegotiate something. I mean, that was kind of the thing. So we can negotiate the design solution based on the fact right. that it's PUD, right? Whereas we couldn't necessarily right. be able to do it if it were two separate. Okay. So, Fair enough. so I'll get the information to everybody as soon as we can, and we'll take it from there. Okay. Any further? Good. Okay. Well, on to uh, item number eight, the uh, eagerly awaited revisions to Chapter 85, signs, uh, discussion of potential amendments. Mr. Seven? Yes. We talked about, we, we saw, uh, the Planning Commission saw a draft that was pretty close to this uh, a number of months ago. and. Um, <clears throat> Basically, what it does, it does two things. It 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 brings the the sign ordinance, Chapter 85, more into conformance with the zoning ordinance. It adds provisions for the three new districts, the three new form-based districts: the Big Beaver District, the Maple Road District, and the neighborhood nodes. So it do, it does that to kind of bring us up to speed with the zoning ordinance. It also <clears throat> adds provisions to control the intensity of the electronic message signs, also sometimes known as LED signs. There's, there's all kinds of different uh, monikers for, the, for these things. And a number of planning commissioners, and I agree with them, think that, um, that uh, the future of signage is in these electronic message signs. And there's one uh, in particular that's, uh, that's on Rochester Road now that, that some people have concern with. Um, it's kind of it's kind of setting the table for, for what we could have more of. And what we don't want is, uh, we, want, we don't want to have electronic message signs that are really bright and uh, cause a safety, not only, not, not only are they unsightly, but more importantly, they're, they're cause a sa potential safety concern. So what we've done is we, we basically, the, the provisions in here are what we, we talked about a number of months ago, and we added um, the provisions for the electronic message signs, which, is, which are, uh, in the middle of the document, we added a first of all, we added a definition. Sure. Mr. Tangle? The letters electronic message sign and there's EMC, is that the correct abbreviation? E e e EMS, good call. <coughs> that's what we were just talking about down here. It's like, shouldn't that be EMS? See, that's, Cana that's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't a typo. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just really quickly hit on sure. So we've de defined uh, the electronic message sign. We defined uh, LED, and most people know what LED is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to go over the things we talked about in bringing it into conformance. Um, what what I, I, I made sure I did was I, I brought, it's a section, article, um, section 850203. I brought Paul Evans in. He wasn't able to attend the meeting this evening, but we wanted to make sure that uh, any provisions that we had were going to be enforceable because if, if you can't enforce, then what's the point? So um, there was there was a provision in the ordinance in a different place that basically said that you you, you can have moving text, moving messages, but they they can't move more than more frequently than once per minute. So we kept that. Um, we, number two, the messages shall be static, so we can't have like movies and things like that. And then thirdly, the the uh, 
The electronic mesh design shall not display light or such intensity of brilliance to cause glare or impair the vision of an ordinary driver or constitute a nuisance. And how do you measure that? Well, the way we measure it is uh, maximum sign luminance shall not exceed 0 0.3 foot candles above ambient light measurement based upon the, the, uh, the size of the sign, another typo, uh, in square feet and distance measured perpendicular to the sign face. And there's a table that, that correlates the area of the sign with the distance and maintaining that three foot candle. So basically what that means is, is you, you'd have to take an, a measurement of the ambient light with the light turned off or the light not there, and then measure it, at, measure it with the light on and kind of you know, compare, compare those two measurements to, to see where it's at. So with that being said, a couple of questions. So I can. You touched on one. You know, I'm not an engineer, and I read that definition of sign luminance, 0 0.3 foot candles. What does that translate into uh, everyday uh, brightness? It's if there's the, a comparison that you can. Well, it's it's really it, it, actually this is I actually know this. It's you know believe it or not, <laughs> it's actually the the brightness of one candle at a foot away. That's one foot candle. How about something like a light bulb or a flashlight or? Yeah. I think, um, if I may, uh, parking lot lighting sometimes is like, I mean, it'll vary depending if you're under the mm -hmm. fixture or between them, but they try to get an average of two, three, four foot candles. Okay. Yeah, that helps. The other <coughs> thing is, um, it, one second, is, is, there, one is, is yeah. there another unit of measurement that's commonly used as foot a candles is quite that's, common. That's it. Um, and you get a, and a meter, a foot candle okay. meter. Right. Mr. Carlyle, before you got here, your compatriot uh, in I'm trying to use an adjective to describe Zach, but uh, I guess <laughs> I can't do a single one. But uh, when we had this before us, okay, he said that um, as we were discussing the electronic portion, mm -hmm. that your firm had quite a bit of experience, at least in depth knowledge regarding this, and. My question to you is, I assume that your firm uh, put a lot of input into the drafting of this section of the sign ordinance. Is there anything that's not in here that you think maybe should be? No, in fact, actually, um, I did um, talk to Paul in regards <coughs> to specifically this electronic message sign um, section, and we actually did provide the, um, the sign um, foot candle measurement table, as well as, um, it should be noted, um, that Brent, uh, uh, Mr. Sob didn't mention, but um, there is a provision here that oh, requires the applicant to get written certification from the sign manufacturer that it can meet these lighting standards. And um, these these signs are, as the architects can uh, can uh, vouch for, they are so well designed today that you they actually basically you can you can internally program to meet these lighting levels, and they're done they're run by computers, so they're pretty easy to program to meet the lighting levels. I especially like that provision where they should be adjustable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank you for mentioning that. Important. I forgot to scroll down and, and, and point that out. Uh, we, we um, how do I say this? We borrowed liberally from some text that Carlisle Wortman had prepared for another community. Plagiarism is a great art. There is nothing to be uh, uh, feeling bad about with that. Why well, duplicate work? It's good. And I, I, I just want to mention a couple of things. One is this once every 60 seconds. That, uh, that also is consistent with the um, the regulations on signage on highways is consistent with that. It's one in every 60 seconds on the highway. And we wanted to tie the, the uh, foot candle levels to an actual standard. So that's also tied to the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. So they have a set standard that we are we are matching to. Well, good job. Thank you. Mr. Strand? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I understand that, you know, this is the technology, the current technology, et cetera, that we've got. But we also have the flip billboards and we have all that technology as well. The question I'm going to ask is myself, where do we stop? We could have all those up and down, all the different signs that we could have on Big Beaver, etc. To me, I, I know of communities that will not allow that to be in their community, period. And I strongly feel that signs do represent the culture of the city or the municipality. And, and I think that is really a a bad representation. I'm opposed to this kind of uh, signage uh, in my own. Well, I look at I look at the signage that Bloomfield Hills has or Bloomfield Township has, and their regulations. They are high end. I think we should be looking at the higher end, not at the lower end, such as uh, Van Dyke. There's a lot of neon signs and a little a lot of those kinds of signs on. 
on Van Dyke. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, we should be adopting. I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed. I, there are a couple of issues here. I know that in the uh, letter to us, you make mention that, that this was actually approved April 28th, but the revisions that are in here are actually 2010. All the revisions say. But at any rate, I've been asking for this sign ordinance for over a year now. And to me, this is a band aid. I, I am really not happy with this. I don't mean to be, uh, it is my personal opinion. I don't like band aiding this just like we did with the, zone, with the Planning Commission, the uh, zoning ordinance. It was a band aid. We had 200 band aids. The same thing that we're having here. To me, this is not. As Mike had mentioned, you know, are we plagiarizing other communities that are a higher standard, or are we just mimicking what everybody else is doing all the way down the line? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm rather not pleased with this. I really am not. I, I really think that I started to read it, and I said, oh, this is a band-aid. This is not what I kind of expected when I was asking for it several times. And we all talked about the possibility, or we thought that we should be reviewing the signs as a part of the site plan approval process. And I hear, or I see the letter here that, Brent, when you wrote this, you said uh, additional revisions would that, be considered. That's, uh, that's been replaced. This has been a revision. I, I must explain that there was a, a revision to explain that uh, there's ongoing litigation uh, against the city right now. And the uh, attorney's office has requested that we just to contain ourselves to this, these particular items, this part of the site ordinance at this time. That's why it appears, uh, I'm sorry you didn't get the, the revised um, a statement that was included in the explanation. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we're not covering everything right now. Because we have to be waiting for guidance from, you, from the city attorney's office. Uh, well, I know that Brent, you had mentioned this to me personally when I asked you about this, that you wanted the staff or higher echelon to actually get approval in order for us to do this. I had a conversation with the city manager before, and he said, no, that's not the case. We are a recommending body. We're supposed to initiate to the council. But you're saying here that the council will make uh, revisions can be made as directed by the city council. I thought they were recommending. We are the recommending body to them. They don't recommend Mr. Mr. Us. We've already we've had that discussion already, and uh, and Brett and I have had, okay. Brett and I have had that discussion, and it's, right. it's 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 well established that we we can, as of ourselves, make any recommendation at any time regarding anything. Someone just has to make a okay. resolution, and we can do that. Okay. And uh, in this regard, where we are just focusing on areas, uh, we especially wanted to address the electronic sign brightness. That was extremely important right now. Other matters related to the site ordinance, we're going to have to defer. I'm opposed to it anyway. Well, that's fine. Okay. But uh, I'm just explaining to you why we are where we are right now, and, and we're going to continue. I didn't realize uh, that. Sure. Okay. So, anything further? Uh, Mr. Schultz? I have a question for Brent. 850203, the maximum light level for electronic messaging signs. Why wouldn't that same intensity and same light level apply to all signs in the city? If somebody puts a big sign on the front of a building and throws metal halide fixtures on it, it's going to be a whole lot brighter than 0.3 foot candles at any given distance. We've, got, we've actually got provisions for lighting and and I believe that those the lights that you're talking about would be covered by uh, by those provisions. I'd have to check though. But these are specifically tied to the signs like the internally lit mm -hmm. LED signs. But the reflected light off a fixed sign could be just virtually as intense as, as the LED sign if they throw enough bulbs on it. You're right. Yeah, but we but we do have we do have provisions for signs on buildings, sign signs shining on buildings, and parking lot signs that are going that are okay. focused down on, on the property. part of the sign ordinance. No, they're part of the zoning ordinance. Any further this time? Mr. Kratt? I, after I read through the, uh, the proposed sign uh, ordinance changes, but this one, what's the comment I'm going to give now is, it's actually not under the revised things. It's under section 85, it's on page 85-1. Uh, it's the uh, <coughs> letter C under 85.01.02 enforcement. And under the C, I read it 
many times and I just can't get my arms around it. Let me read it to you and see if it makes uh, clear sense to people in this room. Um, it says here, if the sign erector or owner fails to comply with the allowed 30-day period, then the zoning administrator shall remove the offending sign within 48 hours from the time of written notification. Well, it, my question is, we, we give this person a notification that he has 30 days to comply with this written notice, and then we say, if they fail to remove the offending sign within 48 hours from the time of the written notice, then we're going to take it down. So it doesn't, it just, it's not clear. I, I think the written notice is the written notice of our intent to remove the sign for failure to follow what they were told to do in their original notice. Okay, but in that case, why don't we say then there will be a second written notice, as a, because we're referring to one written notice only, and this, it says, the owner shall be required to make the sign safe, secure, and otherwise in compliance with the requirements of this chapter within 30 days written notice. Then, if they fail to comply within the allowed 30-day notice, the zoning administrator shall remove the offending sign within 48 hours from the time of the written notification. Of intent to remove, I think, is what's missing. Yeah. From that that's a, that's that's a, does that tell you guys? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sure, yeah. Or, or just say, uh, you know, a second written notice that uh, you know, lets the owner slash uh, erector note that they've, the 30-day grace period's over and now we're going to take it down to 48 hours. It's just, it's just not clear. You know, it's just a minor thing. The other thing uh, I want to point out, it's, uh, it's on a, these tables. It's the table, let me get to it for a second here. Table 85, it's on page 85-15. It's table 85.02.05. Zero five is knocked out, and then six is underlined as the change for this table. This is the standard for ground signs. But going back through all of the text on pages uh, 85-13, 85-14, they refer to table 85.02.05, and that doesn't exist anymore if it's scratched out. You're entirely correct. It is a typo. It should be referenced uh, 85.02.05. So we'll correct that. Okay. Thanks. Good catch. Is there anything uh, further on this this time? Uh, fellas, uh, fellas, uh, fellas, uh, please. The, the sidebar is being picked up by the microphones. I watched the last meeting at home, and a lot of the sidebar conversations are being picked up, and it, it um, doesn't sound. It sounds like we're having a very confusing meeting at home. So I appreciate it being told that. All right, any further on this? Mr. Evans? So are we the leaders in this type of thing with the electronic signs or, you know, in terms of, uh, I look at cities like Ann Arbor or uh, as Tom said, maybe Bluefield Hills. Do we, are we as good or better than them now with this new ordinance? I can tell you my opinion, Ben. You can chime in. I, I think I think uh, most communities do not have these provisions, so I not think at all. some do. Okay. Some, a couple more progressive ones do. Um, I would say the majority of communities do not. Um, I mean, right now we don't have our ordinance does not have any provisions related to these types of signs. We have no no minimum requirements for them. This is gonna this is gonna um, at the very least give us you know give us minimum standards that applicants have to meet, right? which I think put separates us separates us from a number of communities. And if I may have a follow-up? Sure. Um, so all the existing electronic signs that annoy some of us and our distractions, they will all be grandfathered in and as long as they're in business. They, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to pursue getting some type of uh, verification from their manufacturers that, that they have that ability. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask Mr. Monty for assistance on this because this if if, if this is adopted as the revisions as proposed, um, it's not a zoning ordinance, so the the grandfathering provisions don't necessarily apply. But with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Alan and let him tackle it. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, one of one of the reasons we've always recommended doing the sign ordinance 
separate from the zoning ordinance is because then we could legitimately argue that it's, it's a, a police power ordinance uh, and therefore under uh, general statutes as opposed to under the zoning law. That being the case, we don't have to comply with the provisions of zoning law that say we have to allow for non-conforming uses, non-conforming structures. So in theory, if it's a police power ordinance, we could enforce uh, a new provision on, on, on signs that are non-existence if, if we chose to do so. I've got a question then. Um, should we sever this from the revisions uh, to bring the sign ordinance into conformity with our new zoning code and suggest this as a separate revision under the police powers of the existing sign ordinance? Yes, yeah, that's how, that's, how, that's how it is proposed, I believe. Is that yeah. what we're doing? Yeah. So this would be under the police power? Correct. It's a separate ordinance, it's a standalone ordinance. Yeah, this is not, oh, it's not chapter 85, not chapter yeah, Right now, the sign ordinance is separate from the zoning ordinance. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. Fine. separate chapter. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kratt? Um, for a long time, I've always, I mean, I know every profession has their own lingo. Uh, it seems that government really likes acronyms. And uh, in, in our, on, on quite a number of pages, when we refer to the different districts, R1, R2, it used, it used to have actually after it's like uh, definitions, like they would say multifamily has been crossed out or community facility development, well, maybe old names. But the idea is you list all those acronyms for all those zoning things, and just to make it clear as a standalone document to people, uh, anybody reading this, uh, I think it would be helpful to actually list after those acronyms what they are. I just think, well, or even under the definition, even under the definition section, maybe. Either way, you know, so some place in there to make it so you don't have to look at this and say, now where do I go? Good point. Just a, comment, just a comment when Mr. Edmonds said, are we going to be a leader or in the middle of a pack? <clears throat> Last November, I had the pleasure of spending some time in China, and I can assure you that this would put us way ahead of either page <laughs> because they have signs gone mad. It's like, who can put the biggest, brightest sign highest on the building? So I, I applaud this and think it will be a great step forward. Is it the panacea for our sign problems? No, but maybe we're better off to take one bite at a time. What's a start? We'll revisit it. As we go forward, that's for sure. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one more change to this document if it's okay. Uh, you'll notice the, uh, one, the, the table um, that talks about brightness. It, it only goes to a certain size, and I'm gonna, and it doesn't. I'm, gonna, I'm backing up here. It goes to the area uh, 60 square feet. Well, we have sign minimum signs that can get bigger than that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna extend the area so that it takes in bigger signs. Real simple. Sure. Isn't wouldn't that? Isn't there a formula that calculates? Yeah, I've got it. It's, so it's going to be a few more. So or, or if larger than the formula of applies. Yeah. Okay. Ready to move on. Ready to move on. All right. I have this question. Oh, go ahead. So if for a 60 square foot sign, at 77 square feet, it'll be 0.3 foot candles. So it's deep. So that's the minimum foot candle at 77. It'll be more than that from 77 feet closer to the sign. It's got to be. It's got to be um, maintain the three foot candles at 77 feet for at 77 feet for a 60 square foot sign. Yes. Okay. So it'll be much brighter within that. Yes. Or clearly or whatever. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else? Yes. Something else, uh, Mr. Adams? I I do like the. The, the, the provision about the, uh, the message is being static. I think that's. Uh, I called Paul Evans today, and, and, and there's a new electronic sign uh, on the top of the, uh, I think it's Sunset Plaza over there by the Kroger at Long Lake and Livernoy. And when I looked at it, I was just really shocked that it was just so high. It's way up in the air. And according to Paul, he says it meets meets our every all the provisions. So. But they, I guess they took something off. Maybe they took the sign for the, for the shopping center off the top and just put this, you know, it's like a six by eight sign up at the top. 
So they're going to be really, really common, and I think the sooner we get something that... That was the other question I had. How, how soon, if, if this is after the city council approves it, when would it be adopted? Is it like 10 days or something? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, item number nine. <coughs> Potential conditional rezoning application, northwest corner of Square Lake and Dequinder, section one from NA neighborhood node. The CB community business. Mr. Carlisle, is this your presentation? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in your packet, you everyone should have received a um, summary report from our office as well as some additional information um, from Mr. Southern's office. I'm going to quickly go through my report and summary and then open the floor for any questions. The applicant is here to address any issues or questions that the Planning Commission may have. Um, the issue before you tonight is a request for a conditional rezoning to a commercial business at the northwest intersection of Square Lake Road into Quinder. The parcel in question is approximately 0.7 uh, acres in size and is currently regulated at site type B. Um, the requested rezoning is to allow for a uh, Tim Hortons Cafe and Bakery with a drive-through use. Um, site type B's in the neighborhood knows do not allow drive-throughs um, and for this reason that is why um, the applicant has requested a rezoning um, for this parcel. It should be noted that in early April um, the applicant did submit an application uh, to the Zoning Administrator's Office, Mr. Savant, um, Savant, I'm sorry, to request a reclassification of this site from Site Type B to Site Type A in the neighborhood nodes. Um, this is allowed under Section 5.20G of the ordinance. Um, in that, Mr. Savant applies standards that are outlined in that ordinance, and in his finding, the requested reclassification did not meet the findings uh, to reclassify from Site Type B to Site Type A. It should be noted that site types A, um, site type A in the neighborhood notes do allow drive-through uses as a special use. Um, just a little background on the master plan for this particular parcel. As I noted, this is located in neighborhood node N. Um, in the neighborhood node N, um, it is called for low-intensity commercial. Uh, proposed use as a Tim Hortons without the drive-through um, in a commercial use is encouraged, but however, due to site planning issues, um, including the intent to develop a more urban form building, as well as the character of the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, drive-through uses were not uh, contemplated or considered for this neighborhood node end. Um, a little zoning background, site type B does permit a number of uses um, on the site by right. Uh, these include multifamily residential, office, service, as well as retail uses. So as I mentioned, the, the Tim Hortons is a permitted use. It's the drive-through that requires it, um, that doesn't allow uh, that particular use. Um, just, just to note, there, there was, when the ordinance was written, there was a rational relationship behind why um, drive-through uses were not allowed in site type B. And this is due to multi a multitude of reasons, um, but primarily it's due to one is the proximity of the single family adjacent neighborhoods can create negative impacts due to the drive-through use. Um, secondly, there is a um, importance to maintain neighborhood character in the area. Third is there a desire in all the neighborhood nodes to develop urban style buildings and there are arguments that drive through uses don't allow for urban, uh, urban style, urban form buildings which have the buildings close to the street and, and encourage pedestrian orientation. And lastly, often in site type B's, the size limitations alone are a hindrance to having drive throughs that uh, do provide ad adequate circulation and don't increase pedestrian and automobile conflict. Um, specifically in consideration for the rezoning requested, um, these are the issues that, that the Planning Commission should focus on. Uh, the neighborhood nodes are located at major intersections, and a key to these neighborhood nodes are often the corner parcel. Um, the reason that the, the corner parcel is such a, such a significant uh, parcel within the neighborhood node is because often these are the most desired parcels for redevelopment. And as the neighborhood, um, as the corner parcel is developed, that kind of one kickstarts as well as guides the future development of development within those uh, within those neighborhood nodes. Um, it is our finding and our, and our belief that the rezoning um, to CB would, um, would limit the future development of the neighborhood node as intended as the, in the master plan and zoning ordinance. And specifically, um, in relation to the, to the uh, zone parcel site type B, which is just, if you can go back. Sure. Yeah, it's just the parcel just to the north. That would be kind of left, if you just highlight it. That would kind of be left on its own 
um, detached from the rest of the neighborhood node. And so the neighborhood node, it most likely would not redevelop as intended in the master plan and the zoning ordinance with the rezoning. Specifically looking at this parcel in question, as I noted, it's only uh, 0 0.0 acres in area. Um, from the submitted site plan by the applicant, it does appear very, site for ad uh, very tight for a drive through use that allows for adequate circulation and does create some pedestrian and automobile conflicts that we have noted. Um, and additionally, just the size limitation alone uh, does not allow for adequate buffering between the single family uses just to the west as well as um, potential uses to the north. Um, just do the size limitation um, of the parcel itself. So in conclusion, we do strongly encourage and applaud um, the applicant's attempt to develop this parcel, um, especially in its current condition um, as a commercial use. But due to the aforementioned issues regarding the master plan inconsistency, uh, the neighborhood surrounding the surrounding neighborhood character, as well as the small size of the site, we don't feel that a drive-through use or rezoning is appropriate at this time. Um, however, in discussions with the applicant, we have encouraged two solutions. And the first solution is to, if, if you go back real quickly, is to add a portion of the site, and add the entire portion of the parcel just to the north, or add a certain amount of square footage yet to be determined of that uh, parcel in order to have more area to, to put in a, a drive through use that doesn't impact surrounding neighbors and does allow for adequate circulation. The second uh, um, alternative that, that we offer to the applicant is to um, keep the Tim Hortons uh, as currently proposed in its current location, um, but eliminate the drive through use and just have it a standalone uh, freestanding retail building. That concludes our report, and um, we're, I'm, I'm open for any questions from the planning commission. And, and this is, if I could, if I could Mr. Chairman, okay. this is the, uh, the drawing that was provided to us as a, as a potential uh, design for the site. Um, Mark, Mark, who's here? Mark Kellenberger from uh, Tim Hortons. Um, Full marks to him. He's really good at, at fitting a Tim Hortons on pretty well any size parcel. <laughs> he could he could fit one on a potion stamp. I'm pretty confident. Um, Smart car is nice. <laughs> We're on there. Um, so th this is a his their design for. Notice the you know the building on the up to the corner, which yeah, which yeah. obviously is part of the. Um, I, I'm not. I don't certainly don't want to put words in, in anyone's mouth, but um, th there there is the possibility that they'd be open maybe to a to a conditional rezoning involving. You know, the placement of the building and some other some other things as part of the condition um, but I think the the intent this evening was to really kind of put their toe in the water and kind of test test the feed get some feedback from the Planning Commission and see what you thought about a potential rezoning um, to to, uh, to see be in this location okay. is there any uh, questions what, what yeah. type of screening was, will be is proposed for this site the screening walls or is it just landscaping or uh, we haven't done a full site plan review, and I, I don't know, other than the landscape that's indicated on there, we have not received a full landscape plan, so I can't speak to if they're going to do a wall um, or what other screen other than the landscape that's shown up there. Mr. Schultz? Mr. Savadin, unfortunately, I haven't had the capability yet of committing the entire new zoning ordinance to memory. <laughs> um, my, do, next, my next meeting. Do we, do we still have a provision? For a minimum of one acre for drive-throughs in the city? No, we do not. Uh, it is kind of three pounds in a two-pound bag here. Mr. Hagel? A couple of questions. Um, I noticed on the details of the development, the little matrix down in the corner, under required parking, it's got uh, NA, and then there's 20 spaces uh, provided. Is that per the applicant's requirements, i.e. Tim Horton's requirements? Do we know? I, I don't know if they apply the ordinance and, and put the number of parking requirements on the on the table itself, or that's just a requirement of the open the Tim Hortons. So that's what they call it. Yeah. yeah. Um, does anybody remember the size of the Starbucks on the corner of Crooks and uh, Big Beaver as far as acreage? Point six, I think. It was. It was that sounds seven. about right. Oh, well, yeah. About, about point six, I think. It was. It was more than half an acre, but not. It much. was less than one. Yes, correct. Um, the only other observation I want to make right at this time is that I, I appreciate what we have attempted and set up to do in the uh, master plan with the neighborhood nodes, but the practicality of this neighborhood, although two of the corners are not in our jurisdiction, there are drive-throughs on both of those corners. The third corner is a strip center of quite old character, uh, and then we have this vacant property. So I have to weigh that in the context of 
do we leave the, the vacant property or do we look at opportunities to maybe enhance that corner? Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, again, I appreciate what we try to do in the nodes. We, we knew at the time when we talked about those nodes that it's not going to be perfect on every corner and every intersection. So I think, you know, that to me is going to be a, 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 an important factor to consider as we talk about this. That's a good point. Mr. Schultz? One other point I'd like to make. I, I agree with what Mr. Tegel just said. However, the the... 43109 to the north and the 2923 to the west may well for all eternity be residential properties and I think it is in it is our responsibility to be sure that they are properly protected if we let any development on this particular corner or this particular parcel as it stands to go through because there may be families living in those homes for all eternity for all we know you know, just because the Tim Hortons goes in on the corner or anyone else doesn't mean that the property to the <coughs> north is automatically going to be made part of the neighborhood node and become a commercial piece of property. And we have to protect their residential nature. And I just want to, I agree with that. I, I think that's a certain, uh, very important. Mr. Evans? The one that we approved on Maple just recently, I think we approved on it. That wasn't that much larger, was it? And didn't it still have two curb cuts, or was it one? It, it, it wasn't much larger. Um, it had one curb cut, but it wasn't on the corner. True. But it only had one curb cut or two? One. Well, let's hear from the uh, petitioner. Uh, welcome, this evening, gentlemen. Thank you. I'm not sure where you like this. the uh, microphone, please. Yeah. yeah, make yourself comfortable and do what you need to do. Like that? Yeah. All right. There's a there's a little Oh you can see oh, right there. there we go, thank you. It's a while since I've been in this room. Come in more often. <laughs> Back to uh, children development was the last time I was at a meeting in this room. So well, most of you. My name is Bert Kassab. I'm the developer who's trying to develop the corner. Um, you may recall we were before you in April of last year um, with a completely different configuration. You had not adopted the new zoning ordinance yet. It had the drive-through wrapping, uh, wrapping around so that it faced Square Lake. A building was set further back. And all of you appropriately noted that that's not a design that you liked. It wasn't in conformance with the proposed master plan. Uh, really, with Brent's help, and i got to give him credit, he probably gave me the opportunity to meet with him five or six times in the last year to refine a design that meets the neighborhood, neighborhood node site type uh, B requirements in all respect except for the drive-through. Uh, this particular site would not require any variances to develop. Uh, there was a question noted about the, um, uh, the buffer to the house that's to the east, oh, sorry, to the west. We were open to either alternative. We can put a wall and landscaping. The preference, of course, would be to landscape it more and just let it blend in more naturally. But either one of those, the screening would be would be available as an option. Uh, I think there was a question about the piece to the north also being residential. It's actually zoned neighborhood node right now. So it, it permits retail as it sits today. And we think it would complement with hopefully what would go in over there. We were also open, the opportunity, open to the opportunity of having cross access between the two parcels to hopefully spur development. Um, you know, th this parcel, the, the owner is here actually, Mr. Asker. He bought it seven years ago. He was telling me this week that he's been trying to sell it from the day he bought it. He bought it from the city uh, for a development, hopefully. Um, we have been about the only viable party who has stepped up to try and develop this parcel. He has listed it with Signature, with Cushman and Wakefield, with uh, uh, a couple of other commercial brokers. Nobody's really been able to step up. And I think one of you noted that no zoning ordinance is going to be perfect in accomplishing every development in every corner. Uh, we think this one is really in conformance with the intent of the zoning ordinance. As a neighborhood node, uh, you're looking to have a social draw for the community. It's a coffee shop with a patio. Uh, the other two corners, as it was noted, include drive-throughs in the city of Sterling Heights. They obviously have not had any negative impact on the property. Uh, as you can see, we've moved the building as far away from the residential properties, particularly those to the north, the subdivision to the north, as possible. Um, 
at this point, even where the speaker box would be and so forth, you would have an acre at a minimum between this parcel and the residential subdivision to the, to the north. And to the parcel to the west of us, again, the speaker box, rather than being where it would normally be closer to that back of the property, it's actually in the middle of the drive-through lane there. Um, we, we did try to do it through an administrative change, but again, because of the standards that Brent is limited in applying to that request, he was not able to grant us the request. Uh, and, and we felt that perhaps this alternative for contract zoning uh, would be a suitable alternative. Um, again, it, it, the one thing I, I would like to mention to you would be it does conform to the neighborhood node requirements in every respect except for the site type. Um, and, and the drive-through, uh, you know, unfortunately, Mark can attest to this, they will not develop a Tim Hortons without a drive-through. So unfortunately, taking out the drive-through is not an option uh, for us. Uh, I think it was mentioned potentially adding land to the north. Obviously, we don't own that land, nor do we control it. Uh, we've explored uh, other potential users uh, to see if we could do a joint development. Uh, no one stepped up at this point. We're feeling somewhat optimistic that when we get Tim Horn started and going, that someone will likely want to step up and have something on that parcel. Um, at a minimum, it will act as a buffer if it remains as a neighborhood node uh, as it is zoned today between our site and the, and the subdivision to the north. Um, again, this is just an initial step to come before you to get some feedback. If you think this is a viable project, we obviously would like to pursue it further and come back in front of you formally with a full-blown site plan. If you think we're spinning our wheels, then we'll probably call it a day and work on another site. Hopefully not on the other side of the street where drive throughs are permitted. <laughs> Mr. Sanziga? I'm just curious, what are the typical hours for Tim Horton? Uh, Mark can maybe speak more to that, but they do vary uh, anywhere from 24 hours to, uh, I think, midnight. Standard would be 24-hour operation. Uh, we have reduced those uh, at a few locations when dictated either by ordinance, um, by condition, um, or uh, just site characteristics. There are a few sites that were uh, grandfathered or not grandfathered, but allowed to close because of business. Just if there is no business there, it's not viable anymore. But corporately, there's a big production in proving that. So typically 24 hours. We would like to be 24 hours here. Obviously, given the residential neighborhood, we would be able to consider something less if, if that was the if that was the linchpin that made this deal happen. I think we could definitely uh, have that conversation. Mr. Tangle. Um, could you speak to the uh, number of parking spots shown and also the, the two dumpsters, if that's a requirement by Tim Hortons? Yeah, I, I can try to address both of those to your satisfaction. The, uh, the 20 parking spaces are shown as what we were providing. We didn't do a large uh, ordinance analysis, uh, not knowing where we, where we were going to go. Uh, the um, 20 is about right. Um, for this size building, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. I've done as few as with this size building, as few as 18, as many as 28, 32. Depends on the site and, and what we can what we get there. Um, our operations director, our district managers, uh, they're comfortable with the 20 given the location. Um, we believe it's a couple of things that, that kind of drive that. One, our drive-through uses uh, in the morning that, that morning traffic. Um, the neighborhood node, the neighborhood concept, we have that residential flair that we think will uh, attract some non-motorized guests. Um, and then just simply the fact that uh, uh, staffing's not at a maximum at the size of a building. So uh, again, with the guest uh, being provided the uh, ability to park at any given time, and especially with our Cafe Bake Shop, I have to get my shameless plug in here, but with the Cafe Bake Shop, we've went to a much more uh, dining experience. It sounds funny for a fast food, but we've instituted uh, soft seats, uh, fireplace, media, TV, Wi-Fi is now available. So it's much more of a come on in coffee shop. We've adjusted our menu to be more 
cafe. We've introduced the paninis and some new pastries. So it's, it's much more of a come on in, spend some time, uh, trying to be that more local coffee shop, cafe type feel. So it fits real nice. Um, more directly, the 20 spaces are, are what we fit. We're comfortable with that, and I think it would actually fall within the ordinance from our preliminary look. We didn't do a deep analysis. Um, that being said, the other question on the dumpster, um, we typically try to fit a double dumpster enclosure, and where that comes from, um, being um, guided a lot with our uh, home base in Canada, they're much more progressive on the recycling programs. Um, so we've sized our dumpsters since I've been here to accommodate future use of a, of a recycling program. Um, that's why, um, simply put, you know, if, again, kind of going along with the other thing, if that's the linchpin that does it, it's okay. Um, all it does is, is it increases the delivery schedule a little bit, which can be more offensive to the neighbors. So this hand knows it both ways. Uh, we have not had, where we have been located next to residential, we've not had any complaints from a, uh, an order or anything of that sort. So the product isn't going bad necessarily. We're pretty good and diligent with uh, keeping that on a regular basis, but just minimizing the impact, impact at the same time and allowing for that future expansion into yeah. it corporate U.S. model recycling program. Uh, Mr. Strad, do you have a question? Yeah. I, uh, I think you're right that it's hard to legislate every possible condition. And certainly I think the intent of the node certainly I feel is really accomplished here. I uh, have a couple of recommendations, but I like the outside terrace. I like the walk-through capability or the walkability that we're trying to create, which is exactly what you're doing. Uh, I, I lost my image here. But uh, I think I, I'd increase that uh, in that 10-foot setback requirement. I, I know that we did that. Uh, I think we had that setback also uh, with the, uh, what was it, uh, the Starbucks that's on uh, Coolidge. And I wish we would increase that. So I, I, I would recommend, I like what you've done, and I like the intent of what, the way that it's worked out. Uh, as far as the dumpster, yeah, I think that's really an overkill, but uh, I would have it off in the corner. I don't like it where it's at right now from a standpoint of people that are driving by can see it rather than being way in the corner. If it were in the north, uh, west corner, uh, even if you had to lose a parking spot. But that's, those are detailed items. I, I'm more concerned about the overall concept, which I think is excellent. I, uh, I think it really satisfies the intent of the node, the neighborhood node, the building being up in front there and also the outside plaza area. And we have several restaurants that are having outside plazas that are very, very successful, including our newest one, Granite City, is doing very well, and they want to double theirs. But I think I'd like to hear what you said in terms of the coffee shop, the Wi-Fi, the, the environment that you're trying to create is exactly what we want, the walkability, the people that come in. The only thing you don't have is bicycle racks. But those are <laughs> That's a minor detail. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'd be happy to get the same. I don't want to be talking that. about doorknobs when we're trying to talk about Absolutely. the space. But no, seriously, I think that uh, you know this is a, a good, good concept. We have nothing but problem sites right now. We're going to be confronted with all these problem sites, you know, all the time, and we have to be flexible. And I think this is an excellent example of, I think, flexibility. I'd be supportive of it. Mr. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, remind every everyone here that it's not a site plan, and 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 <clears throat> saying that the site plan is up on the on the screen here, um, but I, but I wanted to be fair to the petitioner, um, as Mr. Kassab indicated, they've gone to great lengths. To, I mean, rendition upon rendition to fine tune it to what it is now. To, so to be fair, um, they, they, you know, they've indicated that they do intend to meet, to try to meet the intent of the neighborhood node district. And they, they've done a, you know, a pretty good job of that. And uh, and I, I appreciate Mr. Strat's comments. And and, and um, yeah, as I indicated earlier, it's for those at home. I indicated earlier, you know, I think their intent may be to to kind of do a conditional rezoning. 
um, contract zoning, as Mr. Kassab indicated. So, you know, the, at the end of the day, the, I think the question that, that or the, the comfort level that they want to want to reach is, what is the Planning Commission going to recommend in terms of a rezoning here? Because uh, you are a recommending body for potential rezoning applications, and ultimately council makes the decision, but they're going to lean on the Planning Commission for recommendation as per the rezoning. So it is important to, to, to consider the site plan. Um, insofar as they, they, they may potentially, you know, uh, submit a site plan as conditional rezoning. Mm -hmm. But the, the question I think that, that they're looking to leave here with is what is the Planning Commission going to recommend potentially for this rezoning application? As a follow-up. Uh, Mr. Uh, well, Mr. Hudson, do you have a question? No, I've got a comment. Go ahead. I'm going to throw a little cold water on this discussion because I think a great deal of effort uh, on behalf of uh, this commission in the city was in paying special attention to the neighborhood notes. Um, I, I think that the thoughts of Carlisle Workman with the intent and the reasoning behind their recommendation uh, not approving it with a drive-in is entirely valid. If I were a neighbor, I would not want to have automobiles lined up 24 hours a day, the lights on, radios playing, ordering at Tim Hortons. I like everything about Tim Hortons. Uh, everything Mr. Strat said about the, the setback and the walkability, etc. I love. I love Tim Hortons here. I cannot support a drive-through, though. Uh, I think that in trying to change a rezoning for a conditional rezoning in a contract to observate the intent of our master zoning ordinance, I, I don't like that at all. I think that if you can't do it straight out, I don't want to go behind the back door and come in and achieve something of that nature. Mr. Strange, or something? Yeah, I wanted to ask, on contract rezoning, can they deviate from the ordinance as it relates, for an example, the 10-foot setback from the sidewalk to the uh, to the outside terrace area, can that be moved all the way up to the sidewalk? No, if they've got a conditional rezoning, would still have to meet, would it have to comply with the, with the provisions of the ordinance? Well, in order to ma meet that requirement, they'd have to go before the ZBA. Or, or that it would have to be a condition of approval that they go before the ZBA and get a, get approval. What, under our new ordinance, yes, they would have to go before before the Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance beforehand, yes. But we can't recommend that. We would have to approve it under our, the traditional. Our first, may I, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Our first conditional rezoning application, if you recall, was on uh, was on Livermore, just north of Town Center Drive. It was for a medical office. Yes. And, and as part of the conditions, one of the conditions was um, and if this was approved by City Council, the applicant shall shall be required to to seek and receive a variance from the wall requirement because the neighbor to the north did not want a wall; they wanted landscaping. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they went yeah. to council. They got the conditional rezoning approved. They yeah. still had to kind of roll the dice and, and re rely on the, at the time the BZA's uh, you know uh, action on the variance. Okay, that sounds. Answers my question. I'm sorry, Mr. Sanzika. Well, I agree with Mr. Huss. I, I wouldn't want to have a drive-through 24/7 mm -hmm. in that area, but I wouldn't. Have, I think it may be less objectionable if it were to midnight or to some lesser hour. Yeah. So I, I would, I would propose to consider something like that yeah. if we were able to conditional rezone. Mr. Schultz. Perhaps I missed something. I hope not. Um, why? Do we have to go from neighborhood node to CB? Why can't we just do a conditional zoning rezoning overlay, not a contract rezoning, because contract rezoning is illegal in Michigan, a conditional rezoning laid over top of the neighborhood node zoning that exists? Why do we, because here again, we're in the situation where if we recommend a rezoning and it goes to CB, and Tim Hortons or this developer decides they don't want to develop, we now have a piece of property that's no longer zoned neighborhood node, it's zoned CB, and we've opened it up to a whole bunch of other options. Right. Why can't we just lay a conditional zoning over top of neighborhood node? Hey. Yeah. Are you asking, just so I'm clear, are you asking to essentially rezone it to a different type of neighborhood node? No, I'm saying leave it as a neighborhood node and put a conditional rezoning right on top of the existing zone. The existing zone. You can't, uh, um, through the conditional rezoning process, you can't use a conditional rezoning to, to grant relief from the zoning ordinance. And so 
drive-thrus aren't allowed in site type B, so you can't conditionally rezone it um, unless you rezone it to a zoning district that allows a drive-thru use. But, you, can't but, seek the, you can't use conditional rezoning to allow grief that will okay. allow to that, get relief. That answers it. my first question. My second concern is if we recommend a city council, and we've seen it happen time and time and time again in this city, if we recommend to city council that this be rezoned to CB, and all of a sudden they go, well, we made a mistake in our demographics calculations. This isn't really where we want to build this. We now have a piece of property that we've opened up and we have no control over anything that you, goes in the CB zoning district can go in there. You, if it's, you, go ahead. Under the conditional rezoning process, you can, I'm sorry, the applicant can request or limit the, the permitted uses on the parcel itself. So if the applicant is willing to limit, have a list of uses that they are allowed, they are willing to live with, uh, that can be one of the conditions of the conditional rezoning. The, the, they can essentially say that we're going to develop this, and they can list on the site plan other other things not related, specifically related to site design. Like they could say hours of operation shall not be open between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. Well, I'm just you know, uh, as an example, trash pickup shall be limited to the hours of 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. I mean, whatever, I'm just making things up here, but that's all part of the, of the conditional, potentially of a conditional rezoning application. And so if they don't meet those conditions and they walk away, it then sits void and has to, the new, new applicant, if he doesn't fill those conditions, has to come in and request a rezoning or reconsideration. Yep. Mr. Strand? I'm okay. confused. I thought you said that they have to meet the zoning ordinance first, so we have to change it to, I forgot what the, which one was it? CB. CB. Now, is that 2B actually going to be a part of the conditional rezoning as well? Mr. Schultz was asking that question, I thought. Because it's either one or the other, and if you go with 2B first, and then you go with conditional rezoning, 2B is exposed and they can do whatever they want. What, what, they, what they would, what they int would intend to do would be meet all the criteria of the CB district, which they would have to do, yeah. but at the same time they would meet the criteria of the NN by moving the building to the corner and having outdoor seating and, and, and what have you. So it would try to it would it would need it would need both essentially. They would so they while meeting the criteria of the CB, they would also try to meet the intent of the NN, which which they're which they can do under the under those provisions. You want to repeat that? No. <laughs> for example, for example, if, that's all right. If the CB if the CB required, uh, just let me let me try. If the CB required a hundred foot setback from yeah. from the corner, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be able to meet the NN. But it doesn't. They, the CB allows them to get closer, like they are. Okay. Uh, Mr. Craig? Uh, first of all, I think it's a very creative solution for a small lot. I, mean, I realize we're trying to stuff five pounds of potato in a four pound bag, but uh, I think I, I give a lot of kudos to the person that came up with this, this wonderful snaking thing and uh, the, the hiding of the, the that traffic, you know, with this, um, uh, with this series of landscaping. Uh, Keeping it off, you know, you don't see the parking from the street. Landscaping here also. That's okay. not shown, but that's going to be landscape as well. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, and, and how you've kept the, the waiting line all internalized within the site. You didn't put it on the outside. In other words, cars lined up near that residential lot to the north. Uh, I think it's really, really uh, well done. Um, I have a little bit of angst, though, with the idea of, I don't see any landscaping to the north, and I know it's, Probably, I mean, that's the end of the property. There's no way you're going to put in a row of trees or something. Uh, I mean, it could probably fit in a wall tightly. Um, but keep in mind, this is neighborhood node right here. This is not residential. Okay. It's to the north. It, so it does right. not require a buffer okay. on landscaping. That's, but there's, that's why. There is a resident that lives there right now, right? Oh, it's vacant. I think it's intended to be demolished as far as I know. Okay. Because I, uh, I saw a trailer there. Well, maybe. I mean, they are the renting. <laughs> I, the owners are yeah. two doctors. Right. I know that. I've helped okay. them. Does that order know? Does, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't accept something. Uh, my name is Sam Asker. I, uh, I purchased this property from the city of Troy in 2005. Um, the north actually house, uh, if I record, has been rented, the last time it was rented is in 2006. And since that day until today is vacant. Okay. Uh, they tried to sell it and they could not sell it at all. Um, uh, picked up this uh, property actually 
a uh, few things actually. I like that uh, two pound and one pound actually, I love. Uh, but the thing is, is when I purchased that property originally from the city of Troy, and I still have the original documents on it, it's actually the original, the whole property, the, the size of the property is 275 by 197. It's almost 54,000 square foot. Okay, what we bought from the city of Troy is the 215 by 137. The city already took the frontage Okay, so just for a future development. So the corner actually, it's over an acre, technically. And I have full document of the, from the city of Troy, I can bring it to you. Uh, you, you, yeah, oh, you took, they took e the easements. Right. Yeah, they took it right, right away, yes. So it's, it is actually a big corner, technically, technically for a thing like this. And since that day until today, I, when I picked it up, I've been in the city of Troy since 1993. I have a business down the road. I guess most of you maybe see me. I own the Shell Station on Long Lake and Dequinder. And I used to own multiple locations on the city of Troy, and I have a lot of awards for my landscaping. Um, I did not, I was not have any intent to have a gas station built on the corner of, of this corner, okay, because that's going to be more of my business, technically. But uh, I purchased it, and since that time until now, that's that I have the only serious offer that's come to me last two years that we were working on this for the last two years uh, was it's Tim Horton actually. Uh, nobody offered us anything and we sell it below what even purchased it or was cost me by all the interest that I paid on it until today. <laughs> uh, the only thing is, is is just getting overboard actually for us to survive. Uh, there is another 7-Eleven is the next corner, and they are open maybe 24 hours. So that's something I don't know if we can control or not. I mean, if it's not us, the neighborhood corners, I mean, we are on the corner. So if somebody, if right day tomorrow decide to open 24 hours, how are we gonna control that? That's something we cannot control, it's not in our city. And plus, if we wanna open an office over there, there is two beautiful brand new buildings just on the east of us, Okay, there is the signs for lease. Okay, it's bigger than the sign they have. People want to go into it. So it's, we are just, we just looking, I mean, why don't we develop an office? Why don't we do an office, an office, an office? Okay, but city of Troy full of offices. Okay, and then Bowman Hospital come up and build a brand new office section and they couldn't finish it. They couldn't finish it, they had to sell it. So, I mean, it's not because we want to, the subject that we have over here to put a drive-through is a criteria, is the future. I mean, any coffee shop would look to have a drive-through. Starbucks closed, I live in Rochester, he closed the corner of University and Main Street, okay, and over north of it, okay, just to have a drive-through. He closed a location that had full of people, okay, my cousin on this corner, they, elab they paid $12,000 for this corner plus profit. They closed it down and went north of it just to have a drive through. So, I mean, there is something, I know the corner is like this, the corner is like that, but we sometimes, I mean, we need to change, I guess. But uh, I'll be honest with you, this is the only legitimate offer. And that offer, we are working on it, I mean, maybe with the city for the last year and a half. And some of the city planners maybe saw me. I came with all kind of solutions, with all kind of stuff to develop this, this site. All I know from, no, 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 no. Why don't you buy the north of it? Why don't you buy the south of it? Well, I already bought the first one. I couldn't develop it. How am I going to buy the north of it so I can develop it? Okay. And, and I think, and I'll be honest with you, there is a house next door. Okay, we're planning on something on the future. Okay, well, the house, Okay, if we develop this and we have maybe people walk in and out, maybe there will be, maybe there will be action for more people to come in. Maybe they open a salon, maybe they open, now we are open a door for a doctor to come in and stuff. But now, why are he gonna take that small corner? Okay, and not take the, why he take the house and not develop this? I mean, there is, we, we just say we wanna do this, but we, we are just closing the door, we opening, we have to buy something else to develop something, and I really do not know how, I mean, I, 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 we, 
we own this corner. We that's where I think I think where we did over here or what Tim Horton did. Uh, really, it's worked very very hard to put it on the side, and and it's not bad actually. I mean, there I saw a lot of Tim Hortons are smaller or or bigger, and they are very nice, they're well maintained, and. And this is going to be a building of 2012. I mean, it's not going to be anything less than the future. Well, sir, we're, we're here to, to comment on your plan as presented. We I'm, I'm sorry, yes, I, I know I'm in the planning commission, not only the house commission, but don't think I apologize. No, I don't need to apologize. That's why it goes back on track to what we're here to do. Yes, sorry. And obviously, it's a difficult site. And that's what you're telling us. We appreciate you know, your. Thank you never in your perseverance in, in trying to get the site developed. Mr. So, um, you know, we need to comment specifically on your plan as you're presenting to us and render an opinion to you so we understand where we're coming from. Now, you've heard from a few people already. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence on this one. Uh, I think the site's just a bit small. I understand looking at it in the context that it is, in relation to the other corners, that, you know, it is there is potential here. Uh, my main concern is the proximity to the residences and and seeing, being satisfied that there is enough screening there that the residential uh, area will not be significantly disturbed or disturbed in a noticeable way. It won't affect their quality of life. That's really important. Because all we're doing is creating another problem. You want to develop a problem site, we put this and it creates problems. It doesn't alarm it doesn't really help anyone. Uh, I and understand. If you have the residents have been there. They were there first, okay? And we have an obligation to to protect residential neighborhoods, especially when they have a commercial. So can we work with that? I, well, I like to see whatever the best you can provide as far as uh, screening and buffering and, and some assurances that it will not uh, uh, affect negatively the quality of life of people in your residential neighborhood, then you can make this site work. So that's that's uh, that's my concern. Anybody else? Mr. Strathy was next. Yeah, I just had a real quick question. Uh, yes. I noticed that there were two curb cuts already there. Yes. Did you do that? No, the city did it. Those are the existing curb cuts that you are on this drawing. Actually, correct? it's uh, the city came in 2007 or whenever they decided to wipe the road in that area. Without they noticed that I own the property. So they did whatever they have to do and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and they come up and said, uh, and then they figured out that it's not privately owned. And they said, what do you want? I said, they said we're gonna put curve over here. The, so I really, they decided to okay. do it. All right, that's all I wanted to know. Yeah, but I did not complain. I've been, I mean, I, mean, I under, yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been very faithful for the city of Troy, but uh, I'm not. I understand, but if you. See, you said we need to do a lot of stuff. It's a coffee shop. Uh, I agree with you 100%, the neighborhood. And I'm in the neighborhood too. And I've been there for a long time. Uh, but nobody can control if we do tomorrow, okay, a shopping center, which is maybe it is zoned for a small shopping center. Well, I, again, yeah, and I, I don't, don't want to pizza speculation. And put yes. others and others. Nobody can control what the noises is going to be. Hold on a second. Yeah. I, I don't want this to get carried away. Yeah, I, just, I, just want, I just want to give yeah. you some feedback that you need on your plan. So specifically, I'd like us to uh, provide you with either, is it a viable plan uh, or not, yes or no, or is it viable with certain conditions? I just didn't present him with that opinion and, and uh, go from there. Mr. Tegel? Um, I, I think it is viable. I, I would uh, ask them to consider a couple of things. Hours of operation, reducing the parking by two cars and the dumpster size. And I think if you do that, you can now start to create a very uh, significant buffer on the west property. Um, and, and I think alleviate some of the concerns uh, that uh, some may have around the table about the uh, adjoining neighborhoods. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Evans? Uh, I, I'm very much in favor of the plan. Uh, I don't know what else could go in there. Like he said, he's owned it for seven years, and uh, I think it's, uh, you know, we want to be, it's no secret, Tim Hortons is one of my favorite restaurants. And I'm there <laughs> two or three times a week, so uh, it was there tonight already. So. But the thing I wanted to ask, if I may, if we could get a short answer. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Passion is good. Yes, yeah. The thing I really like about the Rochester Road one is that it's like a joint development. And, and have you ever approached the neighboring property owner with a joint development where the, it could be, you know, like they have? I know they have a, a, a very successful operation there on the Rochester Road. And that's about, what, one acre or something like that, nine, nine tenths of an acre on Rochester Road, the Tim Hortons? Uh, Mr. Casal would know the measurement more than I would. I actually own it, so uh, oh, okay. I, I developed that property, and there were concerns, frankly, from the neighborhood back when we did that, and hopefully many of you have seen that those concerns haven't come to a fruition. It's been a successful project for the neighborhood and the, and the operator. Uh, we, we actually had the property to the north under contract for some time with the hope of doing a joint development, but in these difficult times, no one was willing to step up. We've approached banks and credit unions and other type users, and uh, we weren't able, we were not able to get enough traction to be able to proceed with a joint development. We think that this development will help spur development to the north, and we continue to pursue that site with the goal of ultimately doing a joint development and having cross access between the two parcels. Just one quick follow-up. If in the future, that this, that the adjoining site could be available, would you be amenable to doing a joint then at that point? Oh, absolutely. Again, all you have is parking on the other side there in a the road. Right, and, and it would be perfect to put the drive between the two and put a building on that side and have synergy between the two users, much like we did on Rochester Road. Uh, those two complement each other really well, and, and they help each other in the business side. Um, now, absolutely. Hopefully, ultimately, this will become a joint development of the both parcels, and this will be the first step in, the, in a phase two process, hopefully. And I would be also in favor of uh, moving the, the dumpster and, and beefing up any other buffer with it. I think you may be might even have to do a wall and, and uh, landscaping. So you think viable with some conditions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schultz? I'll support viable with conditions also. I don't necessarily think the dumpster enclosure has to be smaller because hopefully the commercial will start recycling here in the United States at some point. I agree with Mr. Tagel. If they, if they can meet the parking requirements with two less parking spaces so that they could have the buffer along the west property line nine feet wider, um, I think that could go a long ways to, uh, to making this a more viable option. I would not, under any circumstances, support a flat rezoning to CV, though. Mr. Hudson, you still think this is not a viable project? No, I think it violates the the philosophy of that uh, note. And uh, I'd love to have a freestanding coffee shop there, but that drive through kills it for me. Mr. Stratt? Uh, well, I, I'd like to echo some of the comments that were made. I think that uh, I agree that maybe there should be a solid wall there, six foot wall, so that any vegetation that dies during the winter still is protecting that neighborhood, in addition to the 10 foot. Uh, setback that's there for plant material, etc. And also, I'd really like to see some heavy landscaping along the side of uh, Long Lake. Uh, and as far as the, uh, I'd like to see the patios increased, if at all possible, and even increase it to the extent of going up to the sidewalk. I, I really think that that's the whole idea of what we're trying to accomplish, the walkability. And, you know, that, that's important to at least my concept of understanding what the node was intended to be. So with that, I, I certainly, have you, I want to ask one question though, have you tried to buy the property to the north? Have you made any efforts? We did, no, we had it under contract for several months, um, subject to us trying to get a joint user, and unfortunately we were not successful. Uh, their price for, to buy it as is, where is, is above market in our opinion. And there are two doctors, a brother and a sister that own it free and clear, and are simply not motivated to sell it right now at a nice price that the market dictates. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Tegel, do you have anything further to add? Or? Uh, I, I, not that it would be a condition, but I certainly would like to see if you pursue this project, I'd like to see what the property to the north, how that cross, cross access easement would look, the buildings would look and mesh. If I may, <clears throat> we laid this site out kind of with that in mind in that at any point in, in, in talking with Mr. Kassab, looking at the potential to spur that development, you always look at it and go, that's great, I wish it was here six months ago. So in that, with that in mind, we, we left this kind of open, which dictated bringing that dumpster over here, simply because if, if this, this would be a, a very easy cross-connection into that property to the north. Likewise, 
because of the requirements of, of uh, uh, right of way. 